we've identified a risk, you know, people working on the surface, nesting birds, and we're mitigating that risk. Ahead on Frontiers, uncovering the past on Attu Island, what cleanup crews are digging up and getting rid of for good. There are things that he didn't really like to talk about. Memories too painful to share until recently. Stories from an Aleut survivor of a Japanese prisoner of war camp. Plus, although people no longer live on Attu, it's still a popular destination why visitors pay thousands to visit this deserted island. Sponsorship for Frontiers with Rhonda McBride is provided by your local Alaska Toyota dealers. Toyota, let's go places. Alaska, where there are old triumphs, but also new frontiers. With challenges as great as the state itself, but a belief the best is yet to come. Bringing you the faces, the places, and the spirit of the last frontier. This is Frontiers with Rhonda McBride. Welcome to our program as we explore an old frontier in which new revelations have been brought to light. World War II brought great change to Alaska. The growth in military might and the Pacific Campaign swept up the far-flung islands in the Aleutian. The war also changed the course of the island of Attu, the furthest in the chain. KTVA's Bonnie Bowman has traveled to this remote island to show us the impacts of the war 70 years after the fact. Well, Rhonda, the Japanese invaded Attu in June of 1942. Less than a year later, the U.S. took it back in a bloody battle. This started a period of military occupation on the island, which included the construction of airstrips, docks, barracks, all the buildings needed to support the troops stationed there. The military has since abandoned Attu, but what they left behind is a mess 70 years in the making. On the Aleutian island of Attu, the peaceful quiet normally found here is broken. Crews digging in the earth have uncovered a toxic mess. You can smell it, you know, we've got that kind of diesel -y smell, that fuel smell. Decades ago, during the World War II military occupation, drums of tar and fuel were dumped, buried, and left to leak. The goo trapped birds abundant on the island. The cleanup, now in the hands of the Army Corps of Engineers. Some of these drums are still partially intact. Project engineer Andy Sorum knew this was here, but seeing it firsthand is something else. There's more contamination underneath the asphalt. The asphalt has kind of capped it over the last, you know, 60 years or, or 50 years. Now it's taking a crew working 12 hours a day to dig it out. These super sacks hold up to 22,000 pounds of contaminated soil. The crew's goal is 50 bags a day. The crew has already cleared one site, a World War II era ball field turned toxic pit. They came in here, they kind of dumped the contaminant down and then they, you know, bulldozed this kind of generally level. Between the two sites, the cleanup will cost $10 million. But the project that was supposed to take three months just ran into a problem at the barrel dump. Really started to realize that there were a lot more drums there than we anticipated. More drums than the crew is prepared to handle, which means the cleanup won't be finished this summer. You know, we'll make sure that we you know, close up our excavations and protect any of the contaminants from exposing itself onto the water surface or becoming an entrapment hazard for the birds. Hopefully very soon we intend to come back out and finish the rest of this. The chance to come back out means the chance to do more work in other parts of the island. This is them, two old transformers. That's why physical scientist Jake Sweet is on the hunt for other contaminants like PCBs. And they don't break down naturally. So usually something like a, a PCB out here is someone we would have to come out and remove. He spent the last few weeks walking the island looking for potential sources of contamination. It's quiet. It's interesting history out here. 
the only audience to his efforts, the island's natural inhabitants, who are part of the reason, Sweet says, finding old toxins is important. Hopefully do the right thing and, you know, pick it up and send it to where it belongs. As work continues on the barrel dump, Sorum says removing the contaminants protects the fragile environment while remembering the sacrifice of the men who served on Attu. It's an amazing difference. It's a transformation. It, it really, you know, kind of honors the history here and the great things that were done here. Buried for decades, this wildlife refuge turned war zone, then dump, is going back to the birds. Now, in total, the crew removed 12,000 tons of contaminated soil, 90 tons of tar drums, and 52 rusted out storage tanks. They were not able to remove all the drums and will have to go back to finish the work. Rhonda? Quite a work in progress. Thank you, Bonnie. Well, up next, Bonnie will continue our conversation with some history not widely known. But one woman hopes to change that by keeping her grandfather's memories and stories alive. The Toyota Time Sales Event is the perfect time to get the Toyota you've been waiting for. Come in now and you can get low APR financing on the fun-to-drive Corolla, sporting Camry, adventurous RAV4, and more. Get 0% APR for 60 months plus $1,000 bonus cash on a new 2017 Prius. Or get up to $2,500 cash back on select Prius models during the Toyota Time Sales Event. It all ends May 31st, so hurry in before they're gone. Toyota, let's go places. You don't lean to one extreme or the other, and neither does the Nature Conservancy. We're a bunch of regular, practical Alaskans who are making a real difference by protecting the lands and waters we all depend on. By using logical, scientific solutions, we're creating a sustainable future where both nature and people can thrive. If you want to make a real difference without going wild or extreme, join the Nature Conservancy at realdifferenceak.org. Hi. I'm Dee Dee Jonro, I did rat musher and wildfire survivor. When the sockeye fire started, I barely had enough time to load up our dogs and a few personal belongings before the fire burnt our house and all our property to the ground. There are a few things you can do to protect your home and family from wildfires. For more information about being FireWise, log on to firewise.org and you can give a tragic story a happy ending. Brought to you by the Alaska Division of Forestry and the U.S. Forest Service. All right, let's get started. You're both over 50? Yes. Okay, that'll that'll cost you. Why? Uh, the new health care bill in Congress. If you're over 50, insurance companies can charge you five times more. It's an age tax. Any pre-existing conditions? I have asthma. Okay, well, insurers can charge thousands more for that. This is going to be a big bill. Tell Senator Sullivan, vote no on the health care bill. Before World War II came to the Aleutians, about 50 people lived on the island of Attu. After the war, the Aleut village was gone. KTVA's Bonnie Bowman joins us again with a story of what happened to the community as told through the eyes of, amazingly, a six-year-old boy. Yeah, pretty incredible, Rhonda. Nick Golodov was just six years old when the Japanese invaded his home on Attu. Years later, he decided to share his story and wrote a book with his granddaughter. Golodov has since passed, but his granddaughter Brenda wants his story to live on. There are things that he didn't really like to talk about it. Growing up, Brenda Malley never knew her grandfather, Nick Golodov, spent the first six years of his life on Attu. Um, I believe this one was his home. It was really hard, you know, because, I mean, you don't want to talk about something that was like in the past and that was hard. You know, it just brings up emotions that I know he didn't want to bring up. There were things even he didn't understand until he was older, like the mysterious figures seen around his village prior to the Japanese invasion. People there thought it was ghosts because he remembers seeing on the hill, it was foggy, somebody, and he yelled, and then he turned around and go back and they were gone. Wow, so people who were living on the island didn't Thought they know, were ghosts, yes. And it was really the Japanese yes. like, mapping. Uh-huh. They were soldiers who invaded on June 7, 1942, taking over the island and village. He didn't know the little pellets on the ground, you know, they were just popping up. He didn't know what that is, so he was running and it was just like chasing him. 
but he never knew there were bullets until he got older. After two months of occupation, the Japanese took the Atuans to Japan, where over three years, many died. They, you know, they were there, they leave, and then he's never seen them again. So he doesn't know exactly what happened. Among the dead were Golodov's father, brother, and sister. Their loss devastated his mother. He said that he'd see her, you know, cry at night and stuff because, like, she may have been lonely. It was a chapter in her family history Mally says she didn't know much about until shortly after her grandmother died when her grandfather suddenly sent her recordings of some of his stories. He never told me anything about that. He never talked about it, nothing, and then automatically he sent me the tapes. She says it was her grandmother's death that made him decide the story of Atu needed to be told. Together, the two wrote a book. Atu boy. I told my grandfather before he passed that I would eventually get it published. And I'm not sure how I would, but I would do it. Yeah, and you did. Yeah. Yeah. Golodov died before publication, but in these pages, Mally says his story and the story of Atu lives on. When they returned to Alaska, the Atuans could not go home because their village was destroyed. Golodov's family resettled on Atka, an Aleutian island close to Atu. Now, despite his time in captivity at the hands of the Japanese, Golodov actually befriended one of the soldiers later in his life. As a boy, he met the soldier on the island, and the two reconnected as adults. Golodov actually went to visit him in Japan. Rhonda? To visit Atu, that's such an adventure. It was. What was it like for you to be there? It was... In, it was it was surreal, honestly, and it's so quiet. You know, once the work stops and the camp, like, settles down for the night, it's just quiet. There's no noise because you're so far out except for the birds, and so that was, it was unnerving almost. So why has the Army waited so long or, or waited until now to do something about this tar and fuel? Well, the project was funded by the formerly used defense site program, and that money goes to clean up any area the military has left a mess. And so in Alaska, they've done a lot of the work on the road system already, you know, those projects that are sort of in reach. So now they have this money, they're going out to the farther flung areas to clean up. So during World War II, Atu played such a huge role, but I'm just amazed that I've never heard of it. Yeah, I'd never heard of it until I started doing research, and I think part of the reason for that is it is so far flung. There's a beautiful memorial on the island, but very few people ever get to see it. Well, thank you for sharing this untold chapter of history. Well, another piece of history, the Americans fought one of the costliest battles of World War II's Pacific campaign to recapture Attu from the Japanese. The Battle of Attu is known as the Forgotten War. The Japanese invaded the island in June 1942, and 11 months later, American soldiers shipped out to take it back. Wearing desert gear, they climbed snow-covered mountains, hauling weapons and supplies, a bloody battle waiting for them at the top. Their sacrifice is a story few have heard. Attu was actually the second most costly battle in the Pacific campaign, second only to Iwo Jima. Everybody knows Iwo Jima. Nobody knows Attu. More than 500 American soldiers died on Attu. Thousands more were injured. You can see more pictures and memorabilia from the battle at the Alaska Veterans Museum in Anchorage. Up next, we'll talk with Rachel Mason, who helped get Attu Boy published, why it's her mission to keep the memories of the lost villages of the Aleutians alive. I just want cremation. No hidden costs, no add-ons. Cremation is much more affordable. Dignified, ecological. I just want something basic. The simpler, the better. Cremation sure makes a lot of sense. The Cremation Society of Alaska is now serving families in Anchorage and in the Valley. And we are always on the web at alaskacremation.com. Call us today at 277-2777 or in the Valley, 373-8627. Opportunities present themselves every day. Opportunities that move us forward. Opportunities to serve part-time in your community.
while continuing full-time careers or education to help keep our nation safe at home and around the globe. Explore your opportunities in the Air Force Reserve. What is health? It's more than a number on the scale. It's in the water we drink and the air we breathe. It's reflected in our jobs, our climate, and our community. Our health is holistic. Our health care should be the same. At ANTHC, we're providing clean water and sanitation around the state. We're working in partnership to make homes safer, healthcare treatment smarter, and fulfill our vision that Alaska Native people are the healthiest people in the world. Seven decades later, the story still speaks to us today. A story of tragedy, but also a story of hope. A story about the endurance of the human spirit. And joining us now, Rachel Mason, a cultural anthropologist with the National Park Service. And she helped edit Atu Boy. And you've also been working on a number of projects to bring back the history of the Aleutians. And one of those is known as the Lost Village Project. Can you tell us about that? Yeah, um, I've been working on the Lost Villages Project for uh, over a decade now. And it's, it's a story of World War II, villages from the Aleutians, um, that the residents were removed from their, their homes, um, in some cases taken to southeast Alaska, and in the case of the Atuans, actually taken prisoner in Japan. The lost villages are the ones that were never resettled again after the war. The U.S. government was instrumental in uh, preventing people from returning. So, so about how many lost villages are there? There's four that, um, that are in this project. And the aim of the project was to tell this really little known story. Three of the lost villages, uh, the, the residents were taken to southeast Alaska. And in the case of Atu, they were t taken prisoner by the Japanese military and taken to Japan. All four of those villages were never resettled even when the surviving residents came home because the U.S. government refused to let them resettle there. They were told there were too few people, it was too isolated, too remote. Instead, they were taken to other Unangan villages and uh, dropped off and uh, had to, to make a new life there. So how did you come to help edit Atu Boy? For a number of years, Nick Golodov had been working on a memoir and that his granddaughter, Brenda, had been transcribing tapes that he sent, and they were looking for a publisher. So we developed a partnership to- The Park Service. The Park Service, develop it, provide a context for his story. Was it hard to find people like Nick? It was extremely hard to find anybody who was willing to talk about their experience. Nick, uh, unlike uh, many of the people that I interviewed or, or met, actually remembered the time, and he had been a child. He was only six years old when his family was taken to Japan. And so his, his memories were things that a child would notice. And so I guess that gives it a different flavor, doesn't it? it? It's, it's unique. Um, uh, for example, when he was talking about um, the day that they left and everybody was being put on a, uh, a big boat and his memory was of his mother cooking potatoes on the beach as, as they were waiting and, and eating those. And a, a lot of his memories do center around the food that they ate. Because that's important to a child yes. to be able to eat. The Japanese invaded the island. Mm -hmm. And then what did they do with, with the locals? They, well, they stayed for a couple of months in the village. And uh, during that time, they, um, they befriended some of the children, including Nick. Um, the, the Japanese didn't really have any military work to do during that time, so they, they spent a lot of time hiking in the mountains, fishing. It sounded almost like a, uh, an enjoyable time, at least for Nick. The friendship that he had with the, one of the soldiers was documented by a Japanese military photographer. And that's the cover? It became the cover of the book. It's a picture of the Japanese soldier with, with Nick riding on his back. That sort of symbolizes the friendship that occurred despite the fact of, you know, the, the it was tragic war. wartime experience. So how did the Japanese feel about the Atu Islanders? I think they thought that they were 
liberating them from the Americans when they took them to Japan because they, they made them take down the American flag, they put up the Japanese flag. There seemed to be an idea that their removal to Japan would be permanent. Um, they, they encouraged them to bring as much food as they could with them. Which so what did they take? They brought mostly fish. It was in fall time, so they had the fish that they had caught over the summer. It was lucky they did because that was what they survived on. So what happened when they went to Japan? They took them to o Otaru. Um, the first place they stayed was a railroad uh, dormitory. And they all stayed in this one big building. Um, they, they cooked their own food. They, had, they were guarded, I guess you could say, by a, a policeman and his wife who also lived with them. And, uh, and they did uh, work. They really suffered from hunger. And those who died, which was almost half of the Atuans, died mostly from some form of malnutrition or outright starvation. So were the Japanese stenting on the food for them? The Japanese were hungry themselves, and, uh, and there was very little food for, for Japanese civilians in that, in, in that time. Uh, by the end of their stay, the Atuans got o only a small ball of rice um, every day. And um, one of the Atu descendants told me that her mother uh, had never wanted to eat rice again <laughs> the rest of her life. You can imagine yeah. if that was the, yeah. the hardship. So if they hadn't have had that subsistence food going in there. That, that was a lifesaver for them. But they did run out of it eventually, and, and, and that's when the, the real hunger began. So w when they were sort of rescued, there were 40 of them initially. How many survived uh, in the uh -huh. Japanese prison camp? There, there were 25 survivors during the time they were there. Five babies were born, but only one of them survived. As the 25 survivors headed back, some of them stayed in Seattle. They suffered from tuberculosis as, as, as well as from extreme hunger. Some people were hospitalized on the way home. Some of the young people were sent to Eklutna to go to uh, a school there. There were only 11 people coming to resettle in Atka. Tell us a little bit about what happened to those that uh, were resettled, moved from the war, I guess because there was fear that the Japanese would would hurt them or harm them. They, yeah. The idea was they were moving them out of harm's way, but yeah. apparently uh, they wound up uh, in serious trouble. Yeah. Well, in the uh, the summer of 1942, the, um, the idea was to evacuate the Unangan residents from the, um, from the uh, island communities in the Aleutians. Um, they really hadn't even decided where they were taking them yet. Um, they had decided on southeast Alaska, but uh, 831 people were the, the number of uh, evacuees. War is such a horrific memory for, yeah. for many people, right. from, from the military to uh, people that had to survive right. the war. What stands out to you? There's a lot that stands out. One is that... Um, there, there were actual friendships that, that came uh, in this situation. What does that say? That, uh, well, it's a, it's a human story, but I also, I don't want to sound like it was all friendly and joyful either because some of the guards were harsh and some of the, the military were cruel to the Atuans. I know you've interviewed lots and lots of people. What sort of comes to the surface out of all of those interviews you've done with the survivors of this experience? Well, the one thing that they have in common is that they don't talk about it. They don't want to talk about it. In some cases, when I'd interview survivors, they'd change the subject and talk about something else. Or I heard about one woman who came to, to speak at, at a, uh, in a classroom, and, um, and she found herself so overcome with emotion that she was unable to, to even to tell about the experience at all. So just from talking to people who don't want to talk about yeah. it, you get a sense of the tip of the iceberg of the suffering yeah. that people have. Yeah, yeah, and, um, and it's, not, it's not a denial that there was suffering, but it's just uh, an unwillingness to, to go there, to, to think about it. So how did that impact their children, the next generation, the grandchildren? It, it had a, it had a serious negative impact on them, and I, I noticed that particularly with the descendants of Atu who were gathered because 
they, uh, many of them were raised outside of Alaska, had, didn't know anything about what had happened to their parents, and, um, but, but they just knew there was a, a traumatic past that, um, that had never been resolved. And what's the impact of not understanding that piece of trauma in your family's history? Do you think? Do you think that that uh, it, it passes on sort of an intergenerational trauma? I think it does. We had a, a, a circle where everybody got to talk about what their their parents were experienced, and many wept as they uh, talked about their wondering what what had happened to their parents, and and thinking that the fact that you don't know makes you imagine e even the worst. What do you think is the impact of having Atu Boy? Published. Well, it's it's a wonderful gift that that um, that Nick was willing to tell his his story that that his unique child's perspective comes through in this. It's also a wonderful gift that that Brenda, his granddaughter, helped him do that and encouraged him and um, and was determined to publish that book. Rachel, we want to thank you very much for joining us and bringing some of this history alive. Although no one lives on Attu, every year people pay thousands of dollars to travel there for one reason, the birds. Attu is one of the only places in North America where birders can see rare species like Aleutian terns, cackling geese, and Asiatic birds on their migration. There are birders who try for what's known as a big year to see as many species as they can in that time, and some visit Attu every year to add to their bird count. Another big draw to Attu, it's a place to see how birds survive in their natural habitat. I enjoy um, sort of getting to know a species or, or a particular bird and wondering what the heck, it's, why is it doing that? And, and uh, just being amazed by sort of the little everyday things that, that they're doing to survive. Attu is part of the Alaska Maritime National Wildlife Refuge. The price tag to get out to the island, well, it can run $10,000 per person. From birds to old battlefields to stories of the enduring human spirit, Attu is still a frontier full of discovery. We want to thank you for being a part of our conversation, and we'll see you next week.